Hi, Stella. Hello. How are you doing these days? I'm doing really well. Um, we are now kind of rocking and rolling with the new Substack, which is so cool. And we have some really great conversations going on inside that listener community. So I'm very pleased with our shift. And actually, we had a couple people say, oh, good riddance to that terrible Patreon account. Like People are really anti-Patreon these days. So I guess it was about time that we shifted well, over. Substack is having its moment. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's moving. Just this week, you know, didn't Andrew Doyle move from Twitter to Substack dramatically? And like, it's it's just a lovely place it's, yeah. it's it's very nice it's a it's a lovely yeah. they, they've they they're doing it very well they're killing it like people yeah. like I, i've become friendly with michael Schellenberg, and he's from his like you know he's really doing phenomenally well on his substack and it's it's amazing it's a new medium it's a new way of it's a new media yeah that in, a, in a way that has really freed any any interesting thinker they can put it yeah. out the way they want. It's fabulous. It's pretty cool. You're yeah. somewhere else today. I am. I am. I'm yeah. away in London. I go to London quite often doing different little bits and pieces of work. I like it. I I'm really, really love London. And yeah. I don't like many cities, but I do love London. I generally, you know, me actually I'm I'm meeting Kiravel actually after this. Oh cool. yeah, yeah. So I often usually meet somebody or other when I'm here and ah, oh, it's nice. I, I like it. I don't like going too often. Exhausted. Yeah. I... And speaking of the British, today's episode is with Dr. Kathleen Stock. And it was a really, really good one. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. We had a tech failure and we had interviewed her already and it didn't happen. And this interview was a million times better. It was it was yeah. really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll read her bio and then we'll give okay. listeners a bit of a preview of what we discussed. So um uh, Kathleen Stock is a contributing writer at Unheard and the author of a fabulous book, Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. Until October 2021, she was a professor of philosophy at the University of Sussex in the UK. Her earlier academic research concerned philosophical questions about sexual orientation, objectification, fiction, imagination, and pretense. She regularly discusses gender, gender identity, and sex and their effects on women and girls, both in public writing and through her speaking. She was awarded an OBE for services to higher education in 2020 and is a founding faculty fellow at the University of Austin, Texas. She tweets at DocStoc, which we'll include in the notes. And you know, today we talked with Kathleen about, you know, why the trans movement is such a language-based movement. We talked about kind of subjective reality and kind of participating with somebody in their fiction rather than constantly calling out the truth. And when does that kind of shift into tricky territory, which was interesting for us as therapists. Yeah, because we realized, wow, this is, this is our ground. No wonder, no wonder it's become so difficult for therapists around mm -hmm. pronouns because we when, we when we delved into it with Kathleen, it was very interesting. But also the entire concept of inclusive language is what we explored. And I, I think it's had its day. After having this podcast with Kathleen, I think there's better words. We need to now look for a new era of accurate language. I think it's there's better words. But we went, it was quite wide ranging. You know, we talked about all sorts of things and even things like, you know, gender identity and lesbianism and things like that. So. I, I found it a really fascinating conversation. Yeah, we, we hope you do too. So we'll let you just listen in now to our conversation with Dr. Kathleen Stock. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. And this is Gender, A Wider Lens, a podcast dedicated to the shifting concepts around gender in our contemporary culture. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we seek to open up the discourse around this hot-button issue. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, Stella, and welcome, Kathleen. Hello there. Hi. Hi. We're really glad to have you here. Um, we had tried to record an episode with you before. We had some technical issues. That was actually in 2023. So we're just so grateful for your time and that we're back here with you. 
And we Thanks thought we'd me. start, well, you're very welcome. Uh, we want to start with a very easy, breezy question. Mm-hmm. What's the problem mm-hmm. with inclusive language? <laughs> oh, yeah, such an easy opener. Um, well, what do you mean by inclusive language, Sasha? I'd love to hear Stella's thoughts too. When I think about this, <laughs> I think about... I used to do that in school, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you started this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I, I think inclusive language means, you know, there are many facets. One would be pronouns, which is maybe a separate conversation than referring to somebody as, let's say, a woman when in fact they're biologically male. That might be Mm -hmm. inclusive language. Another facet might be kind of blurring the boundaries between sex-based terminology, such as front hole, chest feeder, you know, this kind of neutralizing of sex-based descriptions of things. So I guess there's a bunch of different ways that Mm. inclusive language pops up when I think about it. Yeah, before you jump in, Kathleen, uh, and my own vibe is inclusive language, like a lot of things um, uh, in the last 20 years has has undergone a massive creep. And so it's it's got wider and wider and wider. And suddenly the very clever inclusive language has managed to become offensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then suddenly if it's offensive, is it now kind of exclusive in its own complicated way, if you follow me? By saying chest feeder, you're certainly excluding me because I'm I object to it. I'm out. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like it's it's kind of almost eaten itself. Mm-hmm. I think um, obviously you're right. The concept is creeping and is very poorly defined, which is why I asked in the first place. And I think a, a reasonable definition of inclusive language is language that doesn't draw attention to people's differences where it's not relevant. That seems to me okay. Um, but they, obviously then you're going to have to look at the context and see whether it's relevant. And sometimes it will be relevant to say things that people don't want to hear. But on the other hand, you're not going out of your way to draw attention to them when they aren't relevant. <laughs> the trouble is, I think, in the current atmosphere, um, it's become the pendulum is swinging back. So it's it's been really completely, as you know, taboo to mention sex differences in many contexts for quite a while now. And people have been heavily penalized and ostracized for doing it. So for some people, it now seems relevant to mention these differences all the time as a reaction to that oppressive context. And I do understand that. You might think, look, we have to get things back <laughs> to common sense. And that involves really hammering the point home wherever possible, independently of like particular context. So I do understand that. Well, I think um, one of the things that went wrong, many things went wrong with language and our approach to it. But one of them was that people, academics started acting as if to, um, to say that a definition or category didn't apply to a particular kind of person was in itself um, an act of injustice if they really wanted it to apply to them, <laughs> which is really what they've said about men. <laughs> you know, men really, there's some men that really, 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 really want to be women. And so it's, you know, you should redraw your category to include them. And if you don't, then you've done something wrong because you've hurt them and you've harmed them. And that's a bizarre idea of inclusive language. Like it, like categories are not set up to include. They are by definition exclusive. We, that's how we communicate well, is that this concept applies to this things and not that thing. Exactly. And it's not a ma- matter of social injustice. It's a matter of clear communication. So something went wrong when people started to see categories as like tools of, tools of oppression or tools of justice. That was definitely a, a misstep. Can you say more about that? Because I think that's really interesting that language inherently is exclusive. It's defining Mm -hmm. the boundaries of a concept. Yeah. I mean, so, so go on. Well, I'm just kind of curious, where did it become valuable at some point in the course of philosophical thought to question that? Because I I imagine there is a some sort of test case where we should question the boundaries of like a definition and what it means, but obviously we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So can you just kind of explore that a little bit? So from a kind of realist perspective of the way that the words relate to the world, of course there are going to be cases where your words, um, your categories are insufficient 
because um, they don't pick out what you want to pick out or what the concept was intended to pick out very well. Sometimes they apply to things that really shouldn't be there, you know. So sometimes you can have categories and it turns out that nothing at all fits them, like um, the Victorian concept of phlogiston flog or something. I can't remember. I don't know how to pronounce that properly, but the Victorians had a theory a scientific theory that the thing that made things combust was this the presence of this substance called phlogiston. Mm -hmm. And then later on, a better theory came along, which said, no, no, that's not why they combust. They combust because of carbon and oxygen. And so then they got rid of, there's nothing in the world that, that apply, that the concept of phlogiston hooks onto. So we need to, you know, get rid of that. On the other hand, COVID-19, we didn't have a concept of that until 2019, and then we needed to invent one. But in every case, the world is doing some kind of, um, is making an input, like we're using evidence um, to support our categorization. And then there is a kind of language that is is not descriptive like that. It's really evaluative, and that would include slurs mm. um, and really emotive kinds of language. But the, the the switch came when um, academics, philosophers, started treating all language as like like slurs, <laughs> or all language like um, has having some kind of evaluation involved, like either pejoratively or um, or positively valuing. And once you start seeing all language like that, and you don't think that there is just a purely neutral descriptive use of language, then you can start saying, well. Um, if we change the concepts, we'll be doing normative work <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and, you know, I've said made this point before and other people have made it too. It's not a coincidence that academics turn out to be the ones that point out that um, if you change the words, you can change the world because all they sit, all they do all day is sit around blah, blah, blah <laughs> and writing things, you know, that words are their thing. So they put themselves at the center of the universe, basically. <laughs> and this is the kind of like Foucauldian, Butlerian kind of move that has produced gender studies as we know it. And you know, this whole idea of inclusive language, when you said like effectively language is exclusive, when you say a book, you don't mean a toy. When you say a phone, mm. you don't mean a door. When you see a man, you don't mean a woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> Or do you? No, <laughs> no you don't. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, therefore, when they started on the project of inclusive language, were they immedi immediately bringing in obfuscation and playing around with their heads from yeah. the beginning? Well, not intentionally, perhaps, although... It depends oh, on yeah, I wasn't but... meaning that, yeah. No, no, but I mean, yes. Um, it doesn't... If the If the aim of words and their application and creating sentences is to communicate clearly to your fellow humans with the view of sharing tasks together or communicating information or responding to real life in events, then that will be completely messed up if one party starts changing the definitions <laughs> to mean something else. So, um, so yeah, of course, immediately it got things got extremely confused and that and the, the losers are, are people who are younger and are learning languages or who as English is a second language, as we've seen, you know, they just don't understand the game, the rules, the new rules of the game, because they are so, new rules. So arguably when they started this project, we're now in the kind of second phase where we've seen the problem with the concept of inclusive language. And perhaps this, the new phase should say something like, you know, we go about the great God of inclusive language, maybe it should now move to the great God of accurate language. or Accurate, language. yeah. I mean, or yeah. just inclusion and exclusion obviously have kind of quite emotional, hyperbolic meanings in, in contemporary use. But there is just a straightforward way in which, like, um, it, they can mean uh, this thing gets in here and that thing gets in there, you know, um, this sheep yeah. is included in that pen and this sheep is included in that excluded from that pen you know mm -hmm, it's it's mm -hmm. um it's not it doesn't have to be like a terrible blow to your wounded ego that you don't get categorized in ways that don't fit you yeah i mean it's yeah. also making me think about the kind of implicit fragility that we assign to people when we act as though 
accurate language or accurate descriptions of reality are inherently dangerous to those mm -hmm. individuals. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very, mm -hmm. it's kind of dehumanizing in a way to say that people are not robust enough to acknowledge reality while at the same time, perhaps expressing their desire to be seen a certain way or perceived a certain way or treated a certain way. Not that they necessarily get those things, but I, I don't know. There's something kind of strange about how language is, I guess because academics believe, you know, language can shape the world. It is given so much weight as to yeah. give us it, I mean, these are, this is a, like, this isn't all I should be clear. It's not every academic, it's not every philosopher. It's just some quite influential, influential ones, but yes, I mean, it's psychologically disastrous to send out the general message <laughs> to people that language should be accommodated to their desires and mm -hmm. what they would and their neuroses and their weaknesses and their vulnerability. I do think, I'm sure you'd agree that like in particular cases, it can be imperative to just for that moment, go along with the perspective of a person mm -hmm. therapeutically in order to eventually try and get them back <laughs> to reality. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I went to a conference, an LGB Alliance conference this last year where um, a teacher was saying, you know, dealing with a girl who's just slit her wrists outside the classroom. I'm not going to give her her, her non-preferred pronouns. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to insist at this mm -hmm, point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with a highly distressed child. Cause uh, so there's plenty of yeah, circumstances yeah. where it's just, you're missing the point. If you think that it's now there's the real moment to like go in hard on, on yeah. things they don't want to hear, but that's just normal. But that's not what academic, well, I keep going about academics, but that's not what like gender identity ideology tells us to do. It tells us on, on an, a global scale to protect people from what they don't want to hear in every context. And that's obviously crazy. I can't understand. And you can tell me why psychological associations, psychiatric associations haven't immediately seen the danger of that, mm -hmm. not just in the, in the realm of gender, but just for, for neuroses generally that will spiral out as a consequence it just seems a total dereliction of duty to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not you guys, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because Stella and I recently did talk about this both on the podcast and in a kind of workshop that we did that sometimes in the therapeutic context, you kind of suspend disbelief for mm -hmm. the purpose of connection, yeah. understanding, trying to mm -hmm. gain insight into what somebody's perspective is about himself or herself or whatever. And we we kind of joke about keeping something in your back pocket, you know, without attacking it right there or fact checking it right there. And mm -hmm. this this kind of makes me think about something you've written about, which is, um, you know, with trans identification, there are parts and times and maybe places in society where it isn't necessarily dangerous to participate in someone's fiction. And you talk about that. And I don't want to, you know, put words in your mouth. You mm -hmm. articulate it clearer than I do. But can you talk a little bit about this concept of participating in a fiction and when do you right. think it actually does cause problems for society, for women, for all these other kind of aspects? Yeah. So the basic idea I had in my book was that um, the best sense we can make of these mantras that people will recite, like trans women are women, trans men are men. They, I mean, actually, you don't hear people reciting them as much anymore, but they were mm, back in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um the best sense is that they are really just rehearsing a fiction. They are not actually saying something they believe, most of them. It's more like they're in an imaginatively engaged state, a bit like when you're at the theatre and you're saying, um, look, um, Macbeth's Ooh. wife has a dagger, <laughs> but you know it's just an actress. Or, um, you know, when you're hiding behind your hands at the cinema, you are kind of you're engaged, you're emotionally engaged, you're imaginatively engaged, but you don't believe that what you're seeing is true and you can kind of snap out of it and go to the loo or buy some popcorn or whatever. And um, people, you know, this is just a capacity that we all have. We clearly do. Like we read novels. Some of us role play. Some people have this role built into their jobs where they have to go undercover or mm -hmm. you no, know, be spies or whatever. And they and they adopt a whole different persona that they can leave um, by choice. 
So it's not like really believing this thing, which because belief is something you don't really have that much choice about. You, you either believe it or you don't. So that was my thought. And then, I mean, it was pretty heretical to point that out, actually, <laughs> at the time. But I thought if you put it this way, it gives us a kind of a relatively nuanced explanation of what's going on that then allows people to say, OK, sometimes it might be OK to go into this fiction with you. Um, and sometimes it just won't be. I'm sorry. But, you know, there are other priorities here, like telling the truth with children mm -hmm. most of the time, for instance. And certainly, um, you know, in the law, I think we should tell the truth about sex. And there's loads of, you know, there's absolutely millions of contexts where I think it's really, really important to tell the truth about sex, both at the general and individual level. Um, because sex, as you know, sex differences make a difference to social outcomes. Sex differences make a difference to social outcomes. So mm -hmm. um, now I must admit that when I wrote it, I was... I just thought, you know, I didn't have a clear conception of the times when it would be appropriate and the times when it wouldn't. And most of the time, I think it isn't actually now. Mm -hmm. I do. I think I've become more hardline or whatever, but I do think having seen the absolute devastation of, of going along with people's fictions, because quite often people don't realize you're, you think it's a fiction. They think you believe it too. Yeah. You know, I've, I've cha I've become more hardline. However, in the kind of case I just mentioned, in the case that you have just given us of the therapeutic context, um, or in an interpersonal relationship with someone that you've known for years, and it just depends on a little bit of playing, mm -hmm. role playing, <laughs> in order to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. Fine. What's the harm? I don't see any harm at all. The harm mm -hmm. comes in when it's legislated into, you know, it's mandated. You may not say this. Or you have to say this. You are transphobic if you don't say this, and all the rest of it, all the repressive things that we've seen. So that's my thought. Um, yeah, can I come in on this because it's 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 key to kind of any therapist, like you said, Sasha. We do so we when almost when I start with a client, it's I'm starting a novel, like it's suspension of disbelief. In you go into their world. Tell me it from your point of view. I'm with you all the time. Now I do have my critical brain, but. That brings in the back, the front mm -hmm. part I'm in with the person seeing it from their point of view. And, you know, we do it all the time. Non-therapists do it all the time in the context of mental health out in the world. So if somebody is a bit anxious and they're our sister or our mother or, you know, friend, we might think they're just being a bit anxious there. But we, we nod along. We don't say that's your anxiety. You are you are more anxious mm -hmm. than until it becomes a problem. Most of us just walk along with it. The same with strange eating habits or um, maybe a little bit paranoid. There's so many different mental health kind of weaknesses that we don't call people out because we don't believe that it's our place to. And mm -hmm. sometimes we think it would be very, very upsetting. So somebody mm -hmm. might, in, maybe in Ireland, but somebody might have a couple of drinks on them more often than they should have. And you let it go. You don't say anything. They're not causing a scene. They're not singing. But you are. <laughs> now, when somebody does... Not singing. <laughs> I guess that's the line you don't cross your own Stella. <laughs> Just don't start singing on me. I thought <laughs> that's what happened in Irish pubs. <laughs> and, I've seen um, the films. <laughs> and when somebody does cause it out, when somebody says, I think you're drunk, there was a famous case in, in Ireland in a, in a very well-known Late Late Show, the main TV show, and he asked a famous psychiatrist, Ordi Lang, this was back in the 80s, mm -hmm. and Ordi Lang was really prestigious, really, really intense intelligent man and he was drunk and oh, the, wow. the chat show host Gay Byrne said I think you're drunk and it was really shocking transgression mm. we all could see he was drunk it was mm. blindingly obvious he was drunk but you would never in polite society say to somebody in certain mm. contexts so we do have these legal fictions yeah. all the time now that was an extreme yeah. example but we do have them yeah. and I think that is then <clears throat> put aside and I'm looking at people who say, I have to say he's a man or whatever, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, yeah, but I happen to know you and I know you don't call your mother out on her anxiety day in, day out. I know you don't call out various people in their in their mental health weaknesses because yeah. it would be so ego. But it's not relevant rushing. to the current situation. So that sort of or goes back to my proposed me. definition. I mean, if somebody, 
I mean, I've been in therapy and I'm sure there's many a thing that's come out my mouth that the therapist has just thought, well, that's bullshit, you know, but they don't, it would be a terribly failed relationship if your therapist just kept saying, <laughs> no, that's bullshit, <laughs> bullshit. You, I mean, do people understand how it works? It clearly doesn't work that way. You've got to gently tiptoe around it for centuries, usually. <laughs> So, yes, there's that. Yeah, people don't go up to people and say you're fat. <laughs> they don't go up to yeah. There's lots of things we just don't say because it's not relevant mm -hmm, right now. Mm -hmm. And it would be painful to hear. Um, I think the thing I, is that people are so angry. That, so, you know, for, we, we get it from both sides. Obviously, there's the people that think that we're far too hardline and far too unkind and mean. But there's also the people that think that we're like these total capitulators. Yeah, um, handmaidens handmaidens etc yes um and uh i can see why people the people that call us handmaidens are extremely angry i do understand i mean i've been furious myself for years about the way that language has been coerced out of us the way that we feel oppressed and so on um so it's not like i don't get it it's just that um i can't help thinking that we don't want a world in which people are not allowed to say things that they want to say in either direction as long as yeah. as long as it's not like mandated that's yeah, the thing i i'm the same it's the compelled speech the mandated thing that makes me so uneasy but i i i suppose my the truth teller in me really needs to highlight the fact that we're we're continuously doing mental health legal fictions all over the place mm -hmm. yeah all yeah. day every day I and that's not and just I mean, therapists loads yeah. of people are doing that i um i also think that i mean it's borders on another controversial issue but the reason that some feminists or women in particular have very very little sympathy with ever um colluding or going along with you know preferred pronouns with a trans identified male is that they have a theory about the causes of their trans identification and they think that it's basically um harmful to you know because they think they're all autogynophilic and they think that autogynophilia is always a blight <laughs> so therefore we've got extra reasons not to go along and again i don't agree with that 100 percent. i think it's more nuanced than that mm -hmm. but i can understand it's a theory of the world it's the theory of how people are and they're and they're responding to their theory and i have a slightly different theory but i do you know i partly agree with them in some ways and disagree yeah. in others there's a nice rule of thumb in therapy, which is, you know, uh, enabling behavior or colluding behavior kind of um, supports toxic behavior, but supportive behavior supports helpful behavior. Mm. Do, 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 do you know what I mean? So you're either enabling or you're colluding or you're yeah. supporting. Well, that fits and with the, you know, and they lovely. think it's toxic. They think the, the, the behavior is inevitably toxic, so we shouldn't be colluding. And that's, that, that actually seems like perfectly sensible, given your starting point. Yeah, I wanted to hear from you, Kathleen, because you said I have a slightly different theory. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> oh well, well, I, I mean, it's my theory. I'm not a therapist, the you know. Time. But uh, <laughs> I read with some interest a very long read by um, Joe Burgo. Is it him? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, very recently, on Colin Wright's Realities Last Stand blog, where he has a big long thing about autogynophilia in there. I mean, so from an from a non-expert's perspective, it seems to me that autogynophilia very quickly leads to extremely narcissistic, rageful behaviors <laughs> in many cases. Um, especially when acted out, it seems to me, or at least not acknowledged. I mean, you can correct me, you know more about this than me. But, you know, I, I have met my fair share of extremely rageful narcissists who are autogynophiles with massive personality problems who try to pull me in and push me out and humiliate me and or do all sorts of things are absolutely horrified by the things I say, the moderate things I say. But I just don't think that they're all like that. <laughs> I think because I think it, it would be crazy to make a blanket description of any group of people, even or to kind of files. So I can take seriously the pain that they cause to pe to their dear ones or their loved ones or and i can say that you really it's not a good idea to get lost in an autogynophilic world particularly when you don't know you're there but still i just disagree that it's inevitably 
that that a man dressing up as a woman inevitably means that they're this kind of toxic individual. I'd like to leave room for some benefit for the benefit of the doubt. It's like yeah, I mean, every alcoholic is violent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but some are. And so people just want to push us in two directions, don't they? Either they never are or they always are. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. life isn't like that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have a big issue with trying to make assumptions and presumptions about what's going on in somebody else's mind, heart, soul, and intellect. I mean, like to make mm-hmm. assumptions about a person's internal world based on their external behavior I think is a bit of a God complex because I mean, I got into therapy because I think human beings are very, very complex. Mm -hmm. And despite there being maybe some broad patterns that we can recognize and categories and whatever, individuals are very um, surprising and unique. And the reasons people do things are, you know, always nuanced. And that's why, Mm -hmm. you know, there, there are these camps right now. One camp says, all the boys struggling with gender dysphoria are autogynephilic, and that's the reason. Then there's another camp saying all of these boys are actually just, they're completely devoid of autogynephilic experiences, but they are just caught up in a social contagion. And I think both of these camps risk making assumptions about individual people's lives that are probably just a little bit messier, and maybe there's some overlap with those things, but I... I just think, yeah. how can we possibly know what's going well, on? Well, we could do else? some, I'm sure we could do some research. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. Half of these blanket statements are based on on gut feelings and, you know, or, or individual experiences of the of the uh, person doing the talking. Like, well, my husband was a massive, rageful narcissist who abused me. Therefore, they all are all like that. I mean, that, yeah. it doesn't work like that either, I'm afraid. I can see why you'd want want to see it that way this is not a defense by the way you know I don't really care (laughs) that's the Mm -hmm. thing another way you get pushed is that people are like oh you love them (laughs) you're sticking (laughs) up for them you know I can say the same about lots of different kinds of um, personality disorders you know there's lots of cluster b people that I I can just sort of dispassionately say well you have these problems and sometimes you can overcome them and good luck to you but I don't care Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't have a particular Mm -hmm. interest in defending I'm just looking at the evidence like I try to do and saying look it's not always one way or the other that just seems true we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors Genspect and Therapy First Genspect is an international organization committed to fostering a healthy approach to sex and gender the team and members of Genspect strive to promote high-quality, evidence-based care for gender non-conforming individuals. Genspect is pleased to offer a non-medicalized approach to gender with their recently published Gender Framework, and they continue to hold conferences around the world. Visit genspect.org to learn more. Therapy First is a non-profit worldwide professional association of mental health providers who view psychotherapy as the appropriate first-line treatment for gender dysphoria. Therapy First supports psychotherapists working with gender dysphoric youth and young adults and offers public education on mental health and psychotherapy. Visit therapyfirst.org to learn more. Now back to the show. A lot of people these days, and I can see why, they've lost a lot of respect for experts. They've lost an awful lot of respect for mental health experts. I get it. And research is is at a very low end. And people are just plain rejecting research and evidence. Mm -hmm. They're saying it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to argue with that, where they say, yeah, I know know you're quoting uh, research at me about autogynephilia spell, but I reject it. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I again, you you understand it when you see the absolutely abysmal state of research that has come yeah. out of gender studies departments and still is. It's just um, again because they see the program as one of like not necessarily ac- accurately re- um, recording the truth, but they think they're going to create the truth by just kind of magicking it, magicking it into being with some cherry picking and a bit of dodgy mythology methodology. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I totally understand that. Just a kind of tsunami of bullshit has been written in journals about trans women being women and people like us being transphobic and any concern at all for children being like a colonial mindset and whatever they can fling in mm-hmm. print, they will. So yeah, at some point this is completely devalued. Any kind of 
philosophy or sociological research in people's eyes. And then I suppose in the, in the psychiatric and psychological professions and the medical professions too. So yeah, that's a shame, <laughs> but still yeah. we do need to kind of stick up for meth uh, sound methodology, like yeah. neutral, descriptive, trying to keep our biases out of it. Look at what's there. Mm -hmm. That's still good. We, I would love to kind of ask you kind of a shifting gears question here. Stella and I have been talking a little bit on the podcast about how some people think trans is the new gay. And that's why they're so quickly willing to get on board with this idea of affirming trans identification. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if we take the same example with a young, you know, an adolescent, let's say, that's questioning their sexuality, we wouldn't diagnose that. We wouldn't try to figure out what underlying trauma is causing their same sexual orientation mm. or whatever. So I think a lot of people just kind of take some of those principles and apply them onto to mm -hmm. trans. And I, I don't know if you've written much about this or talked about this. I'm not remembering now, but do you have, I'm sure you have ideas and thoughts about that. Yeah. Well, I do. I mean, I think you're right. Um, when you say trans is the new gay, then I guess for a lot of people, um, they get a bit of kudos out of uh, showing themselves performatively to be um, progressive, particularly, I guess, in the States and maybe even in the UK right now when you think that the status quo is quite authoritarian and conservative. So you get to like tell the world <laughs> It really is a small gesture that counts for an awful lot, like just a rainbow flag or something. It can tell people what kind of person you are, where your politics are. You're a nice person. You're a kind person, etc. I mean, it's all nonsense, obviously, as we know, because <laughs> people with those flags aren't very kind quite often. But um, I think uh, there are those also who felt like they got it wrong the first time around. Um but I do think there's an obvious difference for me. The difference is, and it seems, I don't know why people don't really get this. Unless you're like a rabid Christian evangelical person who believes the Bible to the letter, then being lesbian or gay is not dysfunctional behavior. That And it doesn't involve cutting bits of your body off, giving yourself, taking drugs for life, getting extremely distressed, <laughs> you know, when people won't go along with your version of the world. You know, there's, I don't think you can say that intrinsically being lesbian or gay is um, is bad for that person. Unless you've got some kind of evangelical outlook. But I really do think I'm afraid that for most trans identified people, it's it's not very good for them because it involves, if you're serious, like interrupting healthy physical processes with extremely powerful hormones that we don't understand very much about and it turns out it looks like they may have really bad consequences for well-being or taking bit body parts off or at the very least interrupting the relationships around you as you demand that people see the world you do so like why would anyone want that for their kid <laughs> I mean, if you got it and you try and cope with it, that's one thing, but you wouldn't positively like delight in it. I would not delight in that. And not because I hate trans people, but because I right. can see <laughs> that there are big problems attached. And I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I actually agree completely with what you're saying, but I'm thinking a lot about the way the evolution of the gender dysphoria diagnosis has kind of changed over time. And now it's gender incongruence and the way mm -hmm. there are certain kind of language games, I think that are being played by a lot of the affirmative mm -hmm. care people. And so they mm -hmm. might say something like, like, well, we agree that you don't need to medicalize, but if a person's gender identity is coming mm. from themselves and they say that this is who they are, we have to affirm so that they don't feel pressured to take hormones or whatever. So oh, this yeah. is where that fiction comes in, where it's like, well, let's just go along with it and affirm <laughs> the identity and everybody yeah. can live in kind of this upside down world where words don't really mean what we think they mean. Yeah. And it means something different to each person. So it just takes you into this really esoteric kind of crazy land. Mm -hmm. Upside but, down world. Yeah. And that's harmful in itself. That's harmful for your relationship with your parents, your relationship with your children, your relationship with your friends. Like um, you do. I mean, I do know trans people who seem incredibly relaxed about the language people use for them. Mm -hmm. 
um, and they feel happy that they've made the choices they have and they are willing to put up with the physical downsides in order to live as they want to. And, you know, if that's the case, then I am very happy for them. But I'm talking about like, for instance, parents who get delighted when they have a trans child because they think it's the new gay. That's a child at the beginning of this journey. And you cannot guarantee they will end up like Buck Angel, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you 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 just don't know how the 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 dice are gonna roll in that. And you, there are plenty of stories of it going wrong. So for my kids, I would not want it. But it's it's difficult to have this conversation because of the whole um extra kind of paraphernalia around stigmatizing, you know, mm -hmm. stigmatizing gender identity and not saying it's a mental health disorder. And they just trapped you all in these language cul-de-sacs. So know. you could say nothing at all that doesn't offend somebody, basically. <laughs> Look at wow. Stella's face. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I could I could just see hell there ahead of me there when you were talking, like where we were going. If we kept going this way, we could go into a a kind of a language hell where nothing means what it says, and we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're and no wonder anxiety is the kind of forefront yeah. kind of mental health because you're not sure of anything. I can see it with the generation that are coming up that nothing is sure. There's no solid ground. You're never mm -hmm. quite sure mm -hmm. what anything quite means. Ugh. Yeah. And it's they need parents is to give them boundaries, obviously, as well, as you know, <laughs> like that gives them some kind of sense of security. If parents are constantly adjusting, like, what do you want? What do you want? I'll give it to you. You know, how would you want me to call you? What do you want to say? Yeah. Massive anxiety. Look, I'm not supposed to be in charge. I'm only 13 or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you're so right. And earlier I was thinking about this, too, because you, you mentioned something that I think is really key. I talked to parents a lot about this. You said when we when we go along with someone's fiction, sometimes the person doesn't realize mm, we're going yeah. along with it. And they think we really believe the fiction. And this yeah. is particularly true with adolescents. And what's so, I guess, devastating about this is many of the kids who are questioning their gender because of these new beliefs, they already have a history of difficulty reading social situations and social yeah. cues. Oh, so they're tragic. already a little bit impaired there. And then you go along and you affirm the pronouns and you affirm the new name and you tell them they're really a boy and they really have no hope of understanding yeah. reality at that point. Yeah. They're so vulnerable. And it's just so unfair yeah. to pretend I, I totally see that, that way. Yeah. I can see that in my um, one of my children who um, I think still doesn't really understand, you know, just takes no fault of his own but just takes the 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 term the sentences at face value like mm -hmm. you can be you know a girl can become a boy i don't think you know if you ask him what it mean, means he wouldn't be able to say but he does think it's true and he thinks it's true because some adults said it and oh that's <laughs> is when you put it like that sasha it's absolutely tragic it's cruel um, isn't it i mean it's mean it's it is cruel, cruel although the parents might the, the parents definitely should know better but often I suppose parents who have children with social who have problems of social perception also have problems of social perception so there's a kind of a you know extra barrier there but um yeah it's it's really it's really devastating to to not explain to kids what how the world really works as particularly yet, when they at the other end of it are potentially like life-changing drugs we do tell kids, you know, Santi and Tooth Fairies and, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And we tell we them do. a lot of kind of trite, um, you know, the good guy always wins and, you oh, know, your beauty is from your eyes <laughs> and things like this. Well, society does. Society colludes a lot with children, I think, to kind of yeah. let them have their innocence. That's the kind of phrase. And it's actually a whole web of, of feel good. Yeah. Okay. But like, again, notions. it sort of fits with your earlier thing about colluding is when it leads to toxic behavior mm. and supporting is when it doesn't. I mean, I felt a bit weird about the tooth fairy and Christmas, uh, not Christmas, father Christmas or whatever, but I, I don't think it, you know, devastated. Mm, it's very good. My point, children yeah. when they eventually found out. I did um, think that some parents go really into the pretending 
Santi is is real with footprints and snow and well, lino crumbs. I, I I was terrified of, of Father Christmas because I thought that this man with a beard comes into my room. Are you kidding? Like I would lie awake. <laughs> terrified oh, of a bearded old man at the end of my bed because <laughs> I really no thought kidding true, obviously <laughs> yeah well I mean I, I mean I wonder if you studied this when you were studying fiction like there are fictions that we tell society like parables and you know stories in the bible and all kinds of things in order to control you know control behavior which has really I think some positive mm -hmm meaning behind it like we tell kids the Hansel and Gretel story so that they don't run away into the forest by themselves so, you know like all these kind mm -hmm. of fictions we tell them the Santa story so that they will behave well all year long so sometimes these stories serve a, a role but they oh, are sure. temporary and eventually and they, yeah. they find and out they come the badged like once upon a time like there's various cultural markers that we, you learn yeah. to interpret so you realize ah now I know I go into an imaginative state and I imagine all this and then the book ends and I don't like um I don't think oh this is still happening I don't go out and try and find mm -hmm. Hansel and Gretel you know I, I don't relate yeah. it and integrate it into my action in other contexts and there is a period in a child's development where they can't really do that so mm -hmm. I think watching very young children they're right in the middle of like a fantastical world where fiction and reality yeah. are just kind of merging and they haven't got a clue what's real or not real. Yeah. It's all just stream of consciousness and it's beautiful. Yeah. But yeah. gradually things separate out and they realize this is the imaginative realm and this is the real world and they know what that means. And obviously if we just say, um, you know, women can have penises and we say it straight faced mm -hmm. and we actually get cross when they, they question it, they're going to think, oh, well, that's, that's clearly not one of the magical fictions. That's that's something else. <laughs> um, as well as that, like, you know, when children, childhood onset gentle dysphoria, which, you know, you could argue that I would have been diagnosed with. And so no wonder kids at three and four like me who say I'm a boy and look at you. No wonder we're not blowing their bubble or, you know, pricking their bubble. No wonder we let them off because they're busy yeah. being a train and a this and a that. Yeah. There's something so, but no wonder, you know, it slides then, you know what I mean? Because then there's an awkward time when they're eight or nine or 10 where it's like, okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> parents in are in a terrible position right now because um, in the old days, as you know, with you and actually with my mum went through a period of being a boy <laughs> and many of my friends, especially my lesbian friends, have stories about um, being a boy. You know, they would get called a boy's name for a while. They they would really wanted to be a boy. Um, but then there wasn't like this surrounding culture to just kind of mm. whisper in their ear, mm -hmm. um, this is the real you. And if anyone denies it in your family, they're dead to you. <laughs> you know. So uh, parents are in a terrible position now because they can't just say, okay, time, time's up now. Santa Claus doesn't exist and you're actually a girl. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Without there being a lot of bad consequences in some families. So I just feel absolutely awful for parents who are trying to do the right thing, but don't know how. Yeah, me too. Yeah, they're in a very difficult position. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we had talked about in our last conversation that I wonder if this is okay for you to talk about a little bit more is that in your own kind of process of life and relationships, you uh, entered a lesbian relationship as an adult. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of thinking about the way you know, sexuality and identity kind of develops over a lifetime. And we, we again, we get these rigid boxes right now, which is that, mm -hmm. you know, if a child was not dysphoric from a young age, then they're not really trans. Or like if a girl was feminine as a kid, then when she's an adolescent, her putting on a more masculine persona is fake. Or, you know, it's like mm -hmm. we get into these kind of boxes. But again, back to my point, humans are very, very complicated and things can unfold in a lot of different ways. So, I mean, you don't have to share too much if you don't want to, but has, has your experience shed any light for you on the way we can understand these kind of processes of identity development? Um, yes, I think it clearly has. Um, I mean, it's not a secret. I've told lots of 
people in interviews that I used to be a lot more femme um, when I was, when I believed I was heterosexual. Um, and so there's def there's the sexuality and then there's a the gender identity. Like I, I can see how, I mean, I haven't got any many, many coherent thoughts about this, but I can see how you're looking for a narrative about yourself that best fits with how you feel in relation to which sex you're most attracted to. And I do see how there's a way in which, because I think it's true of me, that I probably was most attracted to females all along. Um, I just couldn't recognize that about myself. I didn't want to. It was too inconvenient. Um, and so I think sexuality can be masked, even to yourself. And that can sound yeah. crazy. And it's very annoying to lesbians who have been out their whole lives and listen see people like me who was in a marriage and think, you're not fucking lesbian. Fine. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with people. But, you know, I do think generally it, one way was to see me would be, oh, you used to be heterosexual, now you're lesbian. But I think for me, there's a way in which things haven't really changed. It's just that my knowledge of myself has got better. But with my knowledge of myself getting better, it also, or with my just basically coming out, I immediately lost any urge to um, like wear makeup or any kind of feminine clothing or skirts. I haven't worn a skirt in a very long time. So, and I felt liberated and I felt, I did feel like this is me. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the cliches, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my authentic self. Yeah. Um, and I, and people around me said I looked better. I, I, I moved free more freely. I was happier. I stopped drinking as much, you know, I wasn't hiding behind things. I felt like this is, this fits me. This fits who I am. Wow. So this is all a bit incoherent, but yeah, I do get, it's not like I'm one of, I'm not one of those people that thinks, ah, there's no such thing as a gender identity. Mm -hmm. I think there is. I think I am. A, I have a male associated gender identity, to be honest. I, I have I to mean, say, I basically, uh, think of myself as a man most of the time, <laughs> except of course I don't. You know, because I know I'm not. <laughs> I'll be a bit of a stop the press. Actually, stop. Yeah. Well, no, I do. I can't. I mean, it's a joke around for people that know me, like that. I think of myself as a man. I never. I just don't. It's because I just don't think of myself as a man. I'm fully aware that I'm not. But in the way that I relate to other men, other men, <laughs> my fellow men, <laughs> your purpose. I just don't. And part of that is not being heterosexual. I'm just, you know. I can't explain it. <laughs> can't, can't that is so it. interesting. One thing I want to say, because I have you to thank for it, Kathleen, is I heard you say that on Reddit or something about not wearing makeup. And you mm. said it was around about 14. You said, I, I just stopped he high heels and skirts. And this is only maybe a year ago, I read it, or two years ago. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. And I did. Really? <laughs> yes. Really, Stella. Very, yes. Good on you. <laughs> I, I I don't think I might have put a tiny bit of eyeliner on every so often, but I stopped all makeup. I don't. My God. Not, yeah. Wow, I feel like an influencer. You did. <laughs> you you are. totally did. It was lovely. Do you know, though? Like, yeah. Do you remember that um, Facebook trend? I don't know when it was, when you had, to, when people like doing no makeup selfies. Oh, I yeah. I couldn't do one. Like I literally, my friends were tagging me in saying, come on, show you yours. And I couldn't do one. That's how bad I was. And now I never, now all my press photos, every oh, you time. you wore so much makeup, I, you couldn't do one without Well, me. I didn't even, I didn't wear a lot. I just couldn't do without the little bits that I did use. I felt like if I didn't have that, it was something awful would happen. Um, I do, yeah. when I go on telly now, they still slap it on. Yeah. So there's some really absolutely terrible um, I love I love the fantasy that something awful would happen. Like what? Like you'd become a lesbian and marry a woman or something? <laughs> no, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, there obviously sight deep down. I knew I knew the tsunami would open. But yeah, it's, I just I couldn't do it. So I really so do look back on my former self and go, "You were a very different person." Can, can I ask a little bit about this? Because I've noticed a lot of women who become lesbian later, often after they've had kids, and I've often thought there's a procreation. When you mm. said masking, I've often thought, 
is it masking or is it a drive to have babies in a family and then when no obviously... not for me <laughs> well yeah I know I, I have to know that but I I, I thought it could easily be you know, oh yeah I think it could 50s. be 50s yeah I mean sexuality isn't everything in your life I think there's a myth that um it's a modern myth that like we're kind of dominated by our sex drive mm -hmm. or our predilections mm -hmm. but actually people have lots of other important things and in my case um I don't think it was having a family, although I love my family very much, but I wasn't like desperate to, I'm not very maternal. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I do think in my case, it was more like, I just needed to fit in. Because I had had a really tricky time at various points in my childhood of not fitting in. Like I never fit in basically. And I suffered for it. And I just thought I got to a point where I thought, because I hadn't had a boyfriend, I got a boyfriend. Basically, I married my first boyfriend, you know, so I really, wow. um, and he's lovely and I'm very close to him. But um, I do think with me, it was more about like a desire, that kind of drive. And mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly have contemplated being a lesbian age 19 or whenever I oh. started on the heterosexual stuff. I couldn't. Were you a, like a very compliant kid? Um. Yeah, at school. Yeah. I mean, I was actually quite argumentative at home, but um, yes, at school, I was extremely mm. um, compliant to the to a, a problematic level, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this conversation is really interesting because I'm just thinking about the way you discussed masking. And, you know, I I 100 percent believe you. This is your experience and your account. And <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You're doing that thing now. Well, we no, I mean, what I'm thinking <laughs> about is all of the kind of trans identified kids who describe something similar. And and again, I, I think there are roots of all of this language and these ideas that come from really real places mm -hmm. of people trying to kind of suppress things about themselves that they later kind of allow themselves to entertain this idea or this feeling or this attraction or whatever. But these are narratives, right? And so when you take a teenager and you expose them to narratives, I think it's yeah. quite subjective what becomes real and not real. You know, like the way I remember yeah. learning about memory, the way we retell a memory in our head over the course of many weeks, months, and years can reshape yeah. actually what we think had ha happened. So it's just, it's so messy and complicated. And um, yeah, I just, I'm really interested I, in like this because it's like, there's the tangible material truths that we're, you know, making claims that this or that happened in my childhood or this or that thing is real or not real. But then there are lots of subjective truths that matter too mm -hmm. and are important to, in people's lives and the way they construct mm -hmm. them themselves. I think, um, one of I don't often agree with Judith Butler about anything, but I do think that she is actually quite good on this sort of um, messiness of identification and how um, this idea that there's something in us that needs to come out and that it's fixed and, it, and you were born that way or or that it was set very early on um, and it couldn't have gone any other way is just not right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think it can be important to an individual and it probably is to me to kind of hang on to the story that like, this is a better fit for me than anything else. And I do, I think that's true. I think it's obviously yeah. true, but yeah, I don't know why it happened that way. I don't know what, there's going to be some kind of origin story, but it's, it's going to be definitely messy, as you say, and a kind of some total of experiences and relationships with parent figures and mm -hmm. teachers and I don't know, siblings. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. could, could I ask a question that I know uh, I think a lot of listeners will be thinking, because when you see somebody who you think they're lesbian, but they are masking, they haven't admitted it to themselves. It doesn't seem to be in their head at all. And, you know, I'm a guy who's gay and and other contexts, somebody mm -hmm. who isn't admitting something that every maybe every but not everybody else, but somebody who knows them can see. Mm. Did you have glimpses of like you might be walking down the street or you looked in the mirror? Did it occur to you? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs> do, do it's you know a very complicated. I mean, it makes me sound yeah. like an idiot. It really does. But um, I don't think anyone here thinks I, you're uh, an idiot. No, but like stop. in terms of self-knowledge, <laughs> I mean, I 
obviously I had, I fancied women, so that's kind of an information, isn't it? <laughs> Was the most Did you have moments one. of, uh, like, I know, I get that, but there might have been moments of, maybe I'm a little, oh, I can't think that. Do, do you know what I mean? I, I just think it would be nice. No, it was never so that. Many, I, yeah. I had, like, I went to a bar in Berlin or a nightclub in Berlin when I was about 21 and, and like, had an in, a sort of encounter with a very hot woman, but it was, like, just looking at each other. And I do, I do, would occasionally look back on that and think, like, what would have happened if I had gone down that route, like a sliding doors moment? Mm -hmm. But yeah. and I would think about that with some regret, you know. But mm -hmm. um, I yeah. I did I did was always aware that I'd clo I thought I had closed something that I would have liked to explore, and then I realised I hadn't closed it. I always like to ask people, and then I always forget if they have any <laughs> recommendations or podcasts, just because I'm. <laughs> I like to get recommendations, podcasts or films or books that they're watching at the moment or listening to. Well, I'm listen. I listen to loads of podcasts. Um, I particularly like um, one called Bunga Cast, <laughs> which is a um, a politics podcast, international relations podcast, but it's really interesting. Um, I like. I'm also in a podcast. So I, I have an organization called The Lesbian Project that I co-direct with Julie Bindle and we have our own podcast, which is available on all apps. And I recommend that. And didn't um, you just recently interview, I think, Nicole? Yeah, Nic we yeah. did. We interviewed Nicole yeah. Jones. We've yeah. we've had some great guests already. And yeah. uh, we just the idea of that podcast is basically to have a laugh. Um, <laughs> it's not very. Um, I don't know, it's not. It's we're not full of outrage. We're just having a laugh with each other. We're just discussing the week's events, um, and we're trying to inject a bit more relaxation and chill into the <laughs> into the space that is that I is love there. That. So, can you talk a bit about the Lesbian Project and what are what are you enjoying yeah. doing there? Well, that the organization is separate from the podcast. The podcast subs go to the organization, but you know, so the the podcast is quite fun, but the the organization is really serious and basically mm -hmm. we want to um, provide political representation um, with a small p to lesbians who feel alienated and lost in the LGBTQ plus plus whatever soup. Um, we want to do research that is reality based and methodologically sound about lesbian lives because we don't think we can trust mainstream LGBT organizations to do it. Um, they really don't seem to understand basic research met methodology anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we want to talk to policymakers um, about lesbians and find out more about their lives. So, because lesbians are always being shoved in, it's not just trans women they're being shoved yeah. in with, they're being shoved in with gay men or bisexual mm -hmm. women or mm -hmm. queer women, which includes mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just no kind of robust way of identifying them as an interesting group in their own right and their communities spaces are, have disappeared um it's just a really not a great time to be a lesbian so we're trying to rectify some of that that's great oh, it's so needed it's so needed we're, yeah we're i'm very happy to hear that thank you so much kathleen this has been really really interesting we're going to move into our exclusive content and in that, I, I want to ask you a little bit about mm -hmm. Sussex University and what went on, because I suppose so many people in our, our listener community have lost a lot as a result of gender. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you, you came through something extraordinary and anybody who is in the kind of wilderness and is isolated, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're a very good example of somebody who came through. You literally had a change of life. It's been phenomenal. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to listening. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking about that in, in a moment when we go into okay. that. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to visit us on Substack by going to widerlenspod.com. There you can join our listener community, 
access bonus content and resources, plus learn about additional ways to support the show. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.